Almost a bit Very almost. <laughs> So this is an uh, entertainment hour. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it is for me, anyway. <laughs> and even for Bamboozle, because they want to just listen today and learn. So... Ooh, you're challenging me. It feels like gratitude is somehow related to metta, is it? If it feels like it, probably is. How is it connected? Yeah. Obviously, if we are grateful to somebody, then it's likely we're going to have good and pleasant feelings towards them, right? It's likely we're going to feel uh, a good, dis- well disposed towards them, friendly towards them. But I think there's already a degree of metta in the heart if we are able to have gratitude, because we're already able to look at the good in life. And in a sense, it's the fault finding mind that's the opposite to loving kindness, and also, in a way, the opposite to gratitude. Because the fault-finding mind, I like that term, Ajahn Brahm uses that. Uh, It's very apt. (laughs) Because sometimes ill will is not outright hate. In fact, usually it's just a grouchiness and a kind of finding fault. Even if something is almost perfect, you find the one place, the one fault in the system or in the food or (laughs) whatever it is. You know, we find that one thing that could be better. So in a way, when we... uh, find fault, of course, there's a lack of gratitude and there's a a lack of loving kindness too. So loving kindness tends to grow when we're able to focus on the good and the same with gratitude. That's one way they're connected. But I think that's a nice one to ask other people about towards the end if there's time and we can find some more ways that they're connected. Gratitude is also close to... um, to mudita, it's close to being able to rejoice in life, in our blessings, in the wonderful things that are happening in the world. I often think of gratitude as kind of um, mudita towards ourselves, being grateful for everything that's happening in our lives. Yeah. This is always something we're not so good at, but there's plenty of things we are doing well and uh, are beautiful, even if we have a lot of uh, loss. You know, we might have that one friend that is really precious to us. Mm. So it's about learning to see the beauty and the positives in life. Thank you for a wonderful retreat. Are you leaving? <laughs> <laughs> it's not over yet. It might it might go terrible. <laughs> <laughs> But that's very good that you're enjoying it so far. How can I use metta to transform negative attitudes in myself? Well, that's what the talk was about, so I don't know if um, this question came before or after that. Um, But it does really help, because it is the antidote to negative states. And it's amazing when we practice loving kindness and start to notice what it does to our perception of the world, we actually start to see things differently. I had a really lovely email today from someone, maybe I'm not supposed to check, but the other thing is we put an offer on the house today. (gasps) It's only an offer! (laughs) So it might be rejected, but we put an offer. (laughs) And at the same time, I saw a very lovely, very long email from someone who has to be the world champion at writing really long emails because they love to write. (laughs) And it's very sweet because they say, you know, you don't have to reply. I just like writing. Um, And it's it's beautifully written. But the basic gist of it was that um, during Adrian Brown's tour, something I said one day about aversion, I forget exactly what it was, you know, you just say these things. It might have been just looking at the other side of things. I'm not quite sure. Oh, I think it was about the fault-finding mind towards the meditation object. 
that sometimes we find fault, say, with the breath, and that's why we can't stay with it, because we don't really appreciate it. We're not grateful enough, we don't value it, we don't think it's something that's important, or something that's... uh, We just don't have enough care for it, right? So, and then they notice this, and then suddenly it opened up this huge world of aversion in their mind, and they could see aversion everywhere. (laughs) It's like when we lose a little bit of it, we see that, oh, actually it was there all the time, but we didn't realise until it lessens. And anyway, that um, kind of process continued for this person, and uh, they said they realised that, what did they call it? It was like everything was coated with aversion. Everything they looked at, everything they kind of, that they thought was normal. You know, they thought they were looking at life objectively, suffering sometimes, and finding it difficult, and finding people difficult, and a bit noisy, and... And then when they realised that that was because their mind was coated with aversion and they started to um, notice it and then started to see it fade, suddenly the world looked soft and warm and completely different and they were able to pick up little kindnesses that people were doing that before they could see that it was kind but they couldn't feel the warmth, you know. And I think this is how... What was the question, actually? (laughs) This is how metta starts to transform the negative states in our mind. We actually start to see things through the eyes of metta. And uh, it becomes slightly addictive because it's so much more um, conducive to wholesome states of mind. And the thing is, until we um, are actually completely free from hindrances, we're not seeing things as they are. Sometimes there's this myth in the Vipassana movement particularly that Whenever we just close our eyes and observe things, we're observing reality as it is. But the thing is, we're always observing things with whatever lens we happen to be wearing. And if you've grown up all your life with a a negative mind state, maybe because, I don't know, I grew up with a lot of a sort of worried mind state because in my family there was always worry was the natural response to things. So for me that was normal, but it's when you start to come out of that, you realise, oh, actually, that was tinting the way I see things. Or you start to meet examples of people that don't respond like that. And then you realise you you don't observe things objectively at all. You always bring your conditioned tendencies to it. So at this stage, we're just trying to develop perceptions that lead to lessening the hindrances. And when the hindrances are really absent, that means aversion, craving, restlessness, love and torpor, doubt, then we can see things as they are. So meta is really helpful in transforming the negative simply by removing aversion. And um, because of that, we're able to see things in a little bit more of a balanced way. So, yeah, there are faults in the world, but there's also a lot of goodness as well. And we start to feel that it's much more beneficial to tune into that. Just as we were saying in the the, um, talk today, there's all these different ways of looking at the good part of the person. You know, for example, somebody maybe didn't do their duty this morning, but then they're in the kitchen doing extra washing up. You know, you can look at that. You can look at the fact that they really gave something extra that they didn't have to do, instead of looking at the things people don't do, or the way people somehow don't please us. There's always something to be found that's good, and that can conduce to uh, more meta, and that undermines the negativity. So that's... um, that was the main example used today. And then also learning to um, actually steer your thoughts towards thoughts that are motivated by kindness and by gentleness and non-harm. So noticing if the thoughts are coming from a place of aversion and greed and recognising if they are, they're probably not very truthful because you're being coloured by those in this case, they are defilements of the mind. They defile its ability to see clearly. So it's always important not to act or make decisions when you've got those hindrances present because you can be sure you're not seeing things clearly. When you've got meta, there's a chance that you'll choose, make decisions out of some wisdom at least. Yeah. Anyway, there's a lot to say, but I think I said most of it during the talk, hopefully. Yeah. And we just have to practice. I like this message. I've got a heart on it. (laughs) 
That's very smart. I mean, if this was a box full of like about 50 questions, you'd probably get your question answered. Because <laughs> you put art on the front. <laughs> Ooh. All right. How wonderful. Experiencing Metta since Tuesday, thanks to your wonderful teachings, meditation, and lovely presence. Thank you. Oh, well, they are not really my teachings, they're more the Buddha's teachings, but it is really a privilege to teach on Metta, I have to say. It's just a beautiful, uplifting subject to reflect on and to, to share. So it's almost like, you know, because I have to teach something, I really have to reflect on it and dig deep into the meta reserves. So it's actually a wonderful practice for me. Uh, often have tears flowing, but it feels lovely somehow. Yeah. Sometimes that's some kind of harder state in the mind, just softening up. So it's like there's a little bit of an ice cube somewhere, and then it melts. It comes out of the eyes. <laughs> now getting shaking and surges of energy during meditation and also shaking from the um, hips at other times Ooh, that's cool <laughs> do you have any advice yeah be kind to it that's all um, it's interesting that you call it surges of energy because it's probably and the shaking as well it's probably, it could be like old blocked energies simply getting released, like physical energies that uh, are maybe healing somehow, getting released. But also this is uh, one of the types of PT that can be experienced. And uh, I haven't read it in detail, but in the Visuddhimagga, the same commentarial text that these um, categories of beings are found, the kind of metta that we're practicing is found, um, it talks about different kinds of rapture or, or pleasant sensation, let's say. PT, it's called. And uh, one of them is kind of like waves coming over you, but another one is like, say, waterfalls. And sometimes it is kind of shaky and trembly and feels energetic. Sometimes it comes in a surge or a flash, you know, and sometimes it's more systemic and pervasive and it slowly settles down. So it's probably this. Um, and just let it come. It's just nature doing what it needs to do. Probably relieving some blockages, and yeah, obviously it's not uh, intentional. So, so just let it come. If you do feel a bit um, ungrounded with it or a little bit concerned, just um, allow it to be there. But perhaps just recognize you are seated on the ground or on the chair, and just feeling the support of the earth beneath you and then just let it come and don't feel shy and don't worry that you're actually physically shaking sometimes it's just an internal experience but it's not actually um, visual no one can see it but even if they can I've seen a lot of stuff so <laughs> don't worry and most of the time people have got their eyes closed anyway so don't worry about that so yeah don't welcome it don't worry about it don't reject it just let it happen Sometimes there is so much joyful energy, I want to laugh out loud, but feel this will disturb everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, probably won't. I mean, I don't know, you can laugh out loud in your room. Sometimes people giggle. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, don't suppress it forcibly. But I shouldn't really say just express it either, because then we will all be giggling, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes it's contagious. But yeah, this is also a quality of PT. It's the sort of uplifting. That's actually one of the types because there's the the flashes and then there's the like pervasive, there's the showers and then there's the uplifting. Be careful, you might levitate. If we <laughs> see you on the ceiling, <laughs> we'll have to make some kind of net to catch you afterwards because if you lose your... Um, if you lose your continuity of practice midway in the air, then you might come back <laughs> <and> down. <laughs> but no. Uh, yeah, joyful energy and laughing is all kind of part of the, the um, lightness and, and the playfulness of PT. I sometimes think that's why my teacher's so silly. Because <laughs> he's silly. I mean, he's very funny, but in a very stupid sort of way. <laughs> Sorry. 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 But, you know... 
they're dad jokes, aren't they? Really. <laughs> and you know. And, you know. <laughs> but you know, one thing you once said is that uh, when he teaches, and just generally, probably because he's so wise and he keeps saying he's really, really old, he's not that old. Um, he sort of relates to people as if we're all children, and I think in his mind we are, like not in a patronising way, but just in a way that, I mean, we're just grown-up children, aren't we? We've got the bodies of adults, but, I mean, who here isn't just a big kid? I don't know. <laughs> we're just pretending, because, like, society wants us to turn up and look serious and wear a suit and all this business. But, honestly... It's really great travelling with monastics because we tend to be a bit playful and do things that are out of the box because we can get away with it. We look weird anyway, so you might as well, you know, be even weirder. So anything goes because, you know, you can't really be placed in a box. So, yeah, that's really nice. That's really nice. And um, one thing I would say about this is um, try to still stay internal to some extent try to not contain it in a kind of you know stiff way but just recognize that it this bubbliness can start to exude and what happens it's fine if you're in silence and you're not sort of looking around too much but if you do start to engage you can just blow all the energy I've done that many many times I get to this stage where I'm really bubbly and then I think oh I'd just like to talk to somebody once you know and then you have a chat and then you lose a lot of energy because this is bubbling up from a quiet mind actually so the cause of it is the peace and the quiet and um, the energy that that saves basically we spend a lot of energy thinking talking connecting pleasing others Um, so try not to blow it in that way try to just enjoy it within yourself and then you'll find it may build and it will become a little bit more stable and then it will start to quieten and settle so you won't be likely to touch the roof. (laughs) But this is all very lovely and very much a part of the natural process of metta and how it happens. It's different for everyone. Not everyone goes through bubbliness or surges. It's just different. Sometimes it's just very quiet, but it's peaceful. And that's re- and that's a kind of piti as well. So, yeah, sometimes just a softness. Is it okay to forgive but also support taking responsibility for actions and choices? Yes, e.g., a prison sentence for committed crimes. Would it still be forgiveness? Yeah. I mean, in some cases, it may be necessary to put a person inside some institution to prevent them from harming someone else. But unfortunately, the prison system seems to me more a kind of punitive uh, punishment system than really, what do you call it, reparative? Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, rehabilitative system. So... Yes, sometimes we have to. We have to put other people's safety first. You know, if somebody's going around murdering others or torturing others or, you know, they've committed rape or whatever, that might be a a short-term measure. But that in itself is probably not going to help that person very much unless they get some uh, psychological care, some... Also, they actually found in a study in um, Spain, I think it was, that the main reason for people to commit crimes in the first place is unresolved trauma. And that the cure for that is not punishment, surprise, surprise, but it's actually connection. And so what they did was some um, social programs where people who were imprisoned and had some history of trauma would actually learn to um, take responsibility and to do something for others, like, for example, feeding the homeless or um, just working together to feel a sense of self-worth and a feel a sense that they can be good citizens and to have that trust. So I think at some point in the process, these sort of things need to be part of the uh, rehabilitation, not just putting somebody behind bars, because the problem with that as well is that um, if you're in prison, <laughs> you're going to be with other people who have also committed crimes and sometimes not of the same nature, sometimes people who are struggling much more And then you're actually around 
even worse influencers than you would be outside. So what people really need, I think, is, uh, is hope and good examples and guidance in how to change, to be treated as people, not as criminals. Ajahn Brahm used to go to prisons and uh, do quite a lot of work, and he has this beautiful um, perception that he developed. He said, I've never seen a criminal. I never even think of them that way. I've only seen a person who committed a crime. And that is so much different, right? Because that's seeing the whole person. It's similar to what we were saying before about overcoming resentment. You have to see the whole person, including the good, and not just focus on that one thing and try to annihilate it. So he used to treat people as people, you know, and he would even forget sometimes. Even the prisoners would forget when the monks came to visit. And they'd actually say to them, why don't you come and stay here? It sounds much more luxurious than your monastery. <laughs> They'd kind of forget that they were prisoners because the monks were talking to them as friends and they were getting to know each other, <clears throat> which is really lovely. So, um, yeah, I think it is possible um, to take measures as a responsible society to kind of... I don't know about prison, but to... Um, show somebody clearly and convey the message clearly that a certain action is wrong and make sure other people are safe. But we also have to forgive and probably express that forgiveness to these people as well by giving them another chance. So, I think it still could be forgiveness, yeah. Yeah. Mm. that's okay prisons also like create a cycle of like very poisonous yeah. um, influence that then like, that's the thing. when you put someone in prison it doesn't just affect them it affects their exactly. family it affects yeah. their, their community maybe um, yeah. and when they come out it's very difficult to rebuild it so it's yeah. like it actually causes a lot more harm to that ripples outwards from that one person mm. to lots of other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it means they're much more likely to be offended. Right, I guess, again, depending on exactly ha- what happens to them in that prison. But, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. The other thing, and it's one of the things my teacher's most... It was probably the best compliment. He says it's the best praise he ever had in his whole monastic life, was that um, when the... Uh, prison officer found out another monk was going to that prison to look after the prisoners. They said, no, we want you to come. And he said, oh, I'm busy, you know, with other things. I'm sending another monk. Why do you want me? And then they told him, because whenever you come, none of the prisoners that you've counselled and, and, you know, I guess he counselled and also gave a bit of Buddhist advice, but mainly it was the friendship and the seeing them as people and treating them with respect. None of them have ever um, come back again. There's been no symbolism at all. And that's never happened in that prison before. So this is, yeah, this is wonderful, but probably quite rare, I don't know. We certainly, anyone who's up for that kind of work, wonderful, transform the prison systems. Mm. (laughs) Think of new ways to so-called keep society safe. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing such a lot of beautiful kindness with us. Oh, this is because you've been in silence today. You see, you could get your meditation going. So no, <laughs> the meta's starting to come. <laughs> the meta sitter is making me look with fresh eyes at my love for my children. Oh, a mother's love can take many different forms. <laughs> Could you please share any advice about skillful ways to love our children? Love more people like your children. (laughs) Yeah, well, as Ajahn Brahm always says, you're asking a nun here. So, (laughs) you're the one with children. I don't really have children, so if I think I can do better, that would be a big delusion. Um, This sounds wonderful to me, looking with fresh eyes at the love for your children. Because I guess one of the um, difficulties with love for anyone who's really close is the level of attachment we have. And I guess with children specifically, I can imagine that there's a feeling that they are mine because they're born from your body. I mean, especially a mother. 
they're part of you, you know, and it must feel like they're yours. Even my plants feel like they're mine, and they're certainly not born from me because I'm not from a plant, you know. <laughs> so I can't imagine, really, and it's one of the reasons, no offence here at all, because it's a wonderful path to take, but I didn't want to have children because I knew that the clinging would be enormous. So if you're able to look with fresh eyes, that's already fantastic. And, um, yeah, I do think... It's interesting. Somebody gave this thought, and I, I kind of related to it. I thought it was very insightful. They said that although many of us feel that a mother's love is not unconditional because there is clinging and because sometimes a mother does get angry, etc., etc., maybe it's actually more unconditional than we realise because even though you can have all those different moods and attitudes to your children because you're a human being... It really is a, a consistent love, and a mother will always, usually, not absolutely always, but they're kind of there no matter what. I mean, my mother certainly didn't expect a Buddhist nun in the family, <laughs> but she's somehow adapted her expectations to the point she can really actually say she's proud and participate in my life, like n always remembering all the people that I'm around, remembering their names, People even from a few years ago, remember this friend, Mom? Oh, yes. <laughs> and following me all over the globe. And it's just amazing, the adaptation, just to be close and to give that support, you know. So that's really wonderful. A mother's love can take many different forms. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you mean in terms of relating to that same child or whether a mother's love can be extended. But I think the idea in the Metta Sutta is that we can try to extend the love that we have to our own children, to all children, by realising that they are also human beings that are basically vulnerable and, you know, full of hope for their lives, wishing to live meaningful lives and you know, easily get hurt and disappointed and, and extend that out. There was a woman on... Um, Ajahn Brahm's retreat just now, our retreat actually in Sheffield, and she'd been through the most terrible trauma you could imagine, losing a couple of children. And um, and it was amazing. She was practicing. Her practice was her survival, basically, but she'd been practicing as a Buddhist for at least 10 years, I think. She had a meditation group. And uh, she said that, you know, this, this phenomena would happen to her of when you've lost somebody, you, you think you see them in the street, you know. But when that would happen, she could see her mind almost going into the grief. And then she realised, no, because they remind me of my son, I can, I can use that same love towards them. Maybe she wouldn't even approach them, she wouldn't have a relationship with them, but she could still feel the love and allow it to, to live allow it to extend and I think that's really amazing if, if you can do that with a mother's love because love is just love I mean it's actually, there are objects that are more conducive to bringing it out of us but it's a capacity we have and I think when there is loss it has to go somewhere so maybe we can start sharing it already a little bit more I don't know could you share any advice about skillful ways to love our children? Okay, so I can think of one from the perspective of a daughter. <laughs> and I guess that is to give our children freedom to find out who they are, who they want to be, and take their time to get there. Really to give them that freedom and trust. Because it took me a while, and my dad mentioned a few years ago that he, he had this song that had come to mind about me, about hoping I find my way. And I never felt I wasn't finding my way. I always felt I was on track. But from his perspective, he must have wondered, you know, she's gone to India at the age of 19. What's she doing? She's not coming back. Like, we hope she's not lost, you know. So give them time and trust them because they have their own karma to follow. And I sort of knew what I was doing. Not that I could put it into words, but I kind of knew what I was doing. And it was weird because I couldn't not do it. People say it was brave, but I really had no choice. It was like I had a calling, you know, and I had to do that. And I had to take those risks. And I was always sure it was leading somewhere, and it was. <laughs> so um, 
trust them and also let them know that if they make mistakes and if they um, get lost or, you know, lost in their life or um, feel ashamed of anything, that you're always there for them and that, you know, they can tell you the truth and you're not going to punish them for that. Mm. They can really tell you the truth and you won't love them any less. So let them know you're their friend. It's like giving them enough freedom to make the mistakes, but then being there when they need you, I think. But I don't know how that's possible, so good luck. (laughs) (laughs) That must be very hard. Oh, I got bullet points. (laughs) That's very neat. Thank you for your tips regarding limiters. Today I was more relaxed and felt pity. Spelling correct. You're very good with your spelling. I never had this before. I now understand Ajahn Brahm when he says the joy in meditating is better than... (laughs) I know what he says. Better than any other... (laughs) He says the coarse things. (laughs) It's better than sex. And any other and addiction and addictive, okay, is better than though subtle is better than any other joy and addictive. I could have continued for hours. So why didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Yes, good, good. Yeah. It's good to just get these insights, isn't it? It's a kind of insight. Because actually it's not just about enjoying the joy, which is already good because we don't have enough happiness in our lives, I think. It's also about recognising that this kind of joy comes from actually letting go of sensual pleasure. Because as long as there's sensual pleasure going on, it's, it kind of masquerades the subtle joy. I actually experienced that in one retreat where I was having a lot of PT, like bliss for days. And uh, that was through breath meditation, actually, which is why I say that the sweetness of breath, it can actually be very strong PT, even with the breath. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how that... It just continued for a long time. And, uh, And then one day I went... I kind of did it just through habit. I didn't really need any chocolate, but I thought, I'll just have a piece of chocolate because it's six o'clock or whatever in the evening. We can't have much else. Mm -hmm. So I had a piece of chocolate and it was like hiding the subtle joy. I can't explain. It was like turning on a sense that that I didn't need and that was way less interesting, way less refined than the joy that was coming from the mind. Mm -hmm. So I realised if we're just tuned up to that level of kind of stimulation... We don't really feel what it's like when we let it go. It's much subtler, but much purer and more satisfying too. So there's wisdom to be gained because this is how we kind of wean ourselves off sensual pleasure. We don't need so much of the right kind of food or the perfect holiday or, you know, whatever else people do for their pleasures in the world because it's coming from inside. So... And we can recognise that it's a, it's a contented kind of joy. It's not the kind of joy that you need to make last. You can actually just settle with it. And the more you settle, the more it grows. So it's quite the opposite. Because with sensual pleasure, it's like you have to keep going for it, you know, and get more of it and more of it. But with this, it's like the less you do, the more it's there. So it's very refreshing and energising for the mind. Was it the Buddha who said that as long as you're on the path, you will get to the end? Very encouraging. Um, I don't know. Probably. I mean, he did say that the way to enlightenment is the Eightfold Path. So if you're on it, then you will get to the end. And there is a stage on the path which is called, like, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Dhammanusari or Sadhanusari is basically people who are um, destined for stream winning, which is the first stage of enlightenment. And once you reach the first stage of enlightenment, you have to reach full enlightenment. So someone who's on the path to becoming a stream winner, which is the first stage of enlightenment, 
has to get to stream winning. So yes, because they're on the path, they will get there. That is true. But the thing with most of us is we're on it sometimes, and then we're off it the next day, then we're on it now, and then five minutes later we're off again. But the thing is, we're more on it than off it. And that's why our lives have come to this point, because whatever's happened so far, it hasn't got us off. So don't worry, even if you think you're not really engaged on this retreat or you're not sure you should be here. Your life has brought you to here, not to some prison, not to some dingy kind of basement disco thing. Or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You're here, so that's pretty good. So even if you've been in a dingy basement disco thing, which I've been in plenty of those when I was younger, very much younger, um, the fact is you're here now, so you're on the path. So that's the most important thing. Make every step aligned with the Eightfold Path. And the thing is, even when you leave, <laughs> even when you leave, you know, you might think, oh, now I'm not meditating much, but whatever you're doing, you can align it with the Eightfold Path. So you've got to be speaking, acting. You could be sleeping, but if you have loving kindness, you hopefully have loving kindness dreams. You've got to speak, act, and eat. What else have you got to do? Work. So all of those things are part of the path when they're right livelihood, right speech, right thought, right action. So whatever you're doing, you can be on the path, strengthening one or the other factor. And there's usually other things involved, like right intention, right mindfulness, hopefully a bit of right effort. If you're having thoughts of loving kindness, that's a quick way to have right effort, increasing the wholesome states. So yeah, I think we might as well be encouraged, hey, because we made it this far, so that's brilliant. Well done. Is that funny, dingy dark disco? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that dingy <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're very common here, so you know, you can just picture it and it smells kind of stale and kind of there's a slightly sick smell. Oh. It's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> Smoky and. <laughs> <laughs> We're having fun. <laughs> oh, it's awful. <laughs> 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 it's probably like what hell realms are like <laughs> but you know I mean people are just trying to find happiness aren't they and sometimes that's what society suggests so I don't know what do you do anyway I feel sorry for teenagers really I really do I felt sorry for myself as a teenager Anyway, I'm getting too bubbly. Right, I am consoled by your observation that it can be skillful to love the tiger from a distance. But this can be hard with close family members. Any suggestions for how best to love family members unconditionally who are very attached to suffering and therefore can cause others to suffer? In the past, offering Mesta has left my heart very open to pain and disappointment and grief. Yeah. In this case, whether they're family members or not, they are probably in the category of a difficult person. Doesn't mean you don't love them. You might love them unconditionally, you know, even though they're really difficult and attached to their suffering and all the rest. But they are still a difficult person for you. So I think do not try to develop loving kindness to them unless your loving kindness is already pretty strong to the loved person and mainly to the loved person and to yourself as well. Um, so in other words, you have to be resourced. And then you can spend a little bit of time spreading loving kindness to them. But you can still do it from a distance in the sense that when you're with them, you might find it difficult to act with love because old habits come up around family and you're just, every time you don't manage, you might beat yourself up and feel it's hopeless. But when you go and meditate, in that sense, you're at a distance. So then you might just see if you can have some thoughts towards them, maybe even at the end of the sitting. Do some loving kindness to an easy person or do it to yourself or do whatever meditation practice you wish. And then at the end, you can just dedicate the merits of the meditation, any happiness in your heart, any um, blessings of your life, anything, any happiness you've had that day or um, success in some way, and just dedicate it to them and wish them well. 
And if you just do that again and again, like regularly, just little bits that you can manage, then over time you might find your attitude towards them changes. The most important thing, I guess, is to keep your mind balanced. Because unfortunately, when we're close to people who are attached to their suffering and they're in our family, it makes us suffer too, and then we just multiply the whole problem. You know? So, if you can keep your mind balanced, which might mean not being around them all the time, I mean, at least you can make an excuse to go and meditate, right? And you've managed to come here, so you managed to get a bit of time away. Um, then perhaps you'll be a bit more resourced and even when you can see they're attached to their suffering you can be a little bit more equanimous you know that you're doing what you can and that's all you can do you have to respect that for now and um, and they also have to walk their path you know it's unfortunately very hard when we see people we love attached to their suffering most people are attached to their suffering because they don't know any other way but at least if you can come out of yours a little bit, it might show them that there is another way. And otherwise, you've done your best, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a long time for people to learn these things. And maybe sometimes in our families, they, they might not get to the Dhamma in this life. But they might get there in the next life. Especially if you give them a good example. Don't preach too much. <laughs> I'm sure you don't, but, you know, don't worry too much about them. One of the things about Ajahn Brahm as well, I wanted to say this when it came to friendship, he's one of the only people I've ever met that never worries about me. It's just amazing. Because in my family, I guess, love was equated to worrying about people. You know, I love you so much, that's why I'm worried. You know, I wouldn't worry if I didn't love you. <laughs> and it's almost like if you're not worried, then you can't love someone. <clears throat> But with Ajahn Brahm, no matter how much distress I'm in, because, I mean, he's my really close friend as well as teacher, so I tell him everything, and I go through my ups and downs, especially with this project and being away from my community in Australia and many times just wondering if I can survive as a non and so many things, you know, it's not easy. So sometimes I would go to him really thinking, oh, I just can't do it anymore and so beside myself, you know. And it's almost like I was wondering, aren't you worried about me? You know, don't you think you should tell me to do something else? Or, and he just looks at me. You'll be right. I'm not worried about you. I'm like, right, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and after a while I realised, actually, gosh, that's really reassuring. Because he's mirroring to me, like, the part of my mind that could actually just stand back and look and say, OK, this too will pass. You know, because it does. And to have somebody who's not worried about you is really reassuring because you're giving them your confidence and trust. And he's right, because it always passes. And bit by bit, you know, I'm getting stronger and more confident and really secure that no matter what happens, I, I have a friend who's going to believe in me, you know. That's amazing. That's really amazing. So maybe, I don't know if that's possible to develop that to your family but perhaps try not to worry too much and let you know trust that they will learn in time yeah anyway I wrote to my teacher yesterday to say I'm getting so inspired because I got all these stories to draw on through your example it's really nice it's not really about a person because it might sound like I always say the same person but it's just about having these um, teachings in life that are directly observable, you know. It's not just from the books. It's like it really does transform the way people relate. And, uh, yeah, just seeing the power of loving kindness in life, how it transforms a person's relationships and the way they relate to you and the strength that gives you, it's really fantastic. So, yeah, keep going because it works. <laughs> Okay, well, we're out of time for the entertainment 45 minutes. Um, but if there's any one thing from anyone that's burning or that's really important to share, then one thing could be said. If there's anything to add to anything that's been said.
I'll just add, uh, someone was asking about that family member. <coughs> um, I've had someone very close to me that I found very difficult over the past two years particularly, uh, you know. And two things that I, well, a few things I found helpful. First of all, in the book, was it the disciple of the Buddha? Is it Sariputta, who um, his mother berates him and he sits there and she gives him food. He's a monk, uh, so you know, makes on the phone. And he just sits there and she parades him the whole time, saying really nasty things. And he just eats, and then he sort of says thank you and walks off. So he just didn't say anything. And actually, one of the things I noticed is not reacting, being patient, and I think that's in the sutras as well, isn't it? Yeah. Patient. Um, and often, Notice when I didn't respond, it my feelings abated sooner, and actually there was one occasion where this sort of attack on me wasn't. It turned out it wasn't even me who'd done it, so it made and it started to make it with them look ridiculous, which wasn't my intention, but. And then I suppose it goes back to yeah. It's I would end one thing out on branches is it's none of my business. Sort of what that's kind of their karma. That's I can't control them. I can only control what I do. Mm. Uh, yeah, and there's a few things that I found kind of out. Mm. I found very helpful, but yeah, you know, I know it can be very difficult. I wouldn't turn my mask over that, but certainly found. The Dharma has helped a lot. Thank you. Yeah. For the sake of the recording, just in case it didn't pick that up, it's about um, not being reactive when faced with a lot of criticism. And in a sense, that highlights that the problem's with the person doing the criticism because you're not playing into it, right? And the example was about the Venerable Sariputta, who's the Buddha's first right-hand monk. And his mother used to say, you good-for-nothing recluse, blah, 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 when he came for, with his arms bar for lunch. You don't do that to me here, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you good-for-nothing, here's your soup. <laughs> but she did that. And, uh, uh, at least she gave him the soup. I suppose that's an example of pure with body, not in speech, right? <laughs> so he would just eat it and then leave. And after a while, she did come around, actually. Yeah, by the end of his her life, I suppose, she did come around and have respect for her son. Yeah. So, yeah, and the patience. It's really important, isn't it? Not my business, how somebody else behaves. Don't take it personally, yeah, because like you say, it's often not about us. It's about what they're going through. Yeah. And sometimes people who are going through something, they take it out on the people they love most because they just want to express their pain, you know. But unfortunately it doesn't work because then that person feels hurt. But if we can put our sort of ego aside, then uh, the whole thing de-escalates, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Should we sit for a moment before going to bed? <laughs>